potatoes. Have you ever been told that you shouldn't eat green potatoes? So maybe this was something your grandmother said. Maybe you thought it was an old wives tale. Well, actually, it's true. Potatoes contain a toxic chemical called glycoalkaloids, and it can make you really sick and cause vomiting, diarrhea, stomach cramps, and in extreme cases, death. And the amount of those alkaloids is much higher in the green parts of the plant. So you shouldn't eat the green parts. Now, plants make lots of different toxic chemicals, and they do this because when they get attacked by a pest, they can't run away. They have to stay and defend themselves, and a lot of them do this with toxic chemicals. And potatoes do this with alkaloids. Back in the 1960s, they developed a new variety of potatoes that was absolutely fantastically resistant to pests. And when they released it to farmers, the farmers didn't always grow it under perfect conditions and maybe got a bit drought stressed. They put them into the market, people bought them, and people got really sick. So they took those potatoes off the market. So you can be sure that the potatoes that you eat in the supermarket are safe because ever since then, every variety of potatoes that is developed is tested before it's released to market. So I work on a different uh, toxin. I work on plants that make cyanide. And you may be familiar with these uh, in apple seeds, that taste of the inside of the apple seeds, bitter almonds, uh, about 30 different types of eucalypts, about one in 10 plants. So a lot of plants like, make cyanide. And marzipan, you know that smell of marzipan? Not everyone can smell it, but in fact, that is the smell of cyanide. However, the levels in marzipan are very low. Marzipan's not going to kill you. And uh, it's quite safe in marzipan because the amount that you can eat depends on how big you are and what else you're eating, if you're eating protein. If you're eating a certain amount of protein, you can actually detoxify the cyanide and you just excrete it in the urine and it's okay. Uh, but if you eat a lot of cyanide, it can cause toxicity, and that will depend on how big you are. So for someone my size, I need to eat about 60 milligrams of cyanide to kill me. It's actually not a lot. So I worked out, for example, on an apple core that had a lot of seeds in it, I'd probably need to eat about 30 apple cores to kill me. And this particular eucalypt, this is a sugar gum leaf, I actually measured this leaf and worked out how many of these leaves would kill me and I'd have to have 30 full-grown leaves, finely ground, eaten all in one go if it was going to kill me. So it is actually very toxic. So how did I get into this? Well, I was really fortunate. I grew up, that's me, I grew up in a family that valued education. Both my parents were medical doctors, and I grew up thinking that I would become a doctor. I wanted to become a doctor. In fact, my parents were very outward looking and I wanted to become a doctor and go to Africa and save the world. That's, I always thought I'd wanted to do that. But when I got into high school, I got interested in all kinds of other types of biology. Animal biology, plants really attracted me, genetics. And so when I left school, instead of studying medicine, I enrolled in a science degree and I did a major in botany. In my family, that was actually a very rebellious thing to do. So I went on and I ended up doing a PhD in botany in plant-animal interactions, and in particular on a group of eucalyptus that makes cyanide, and I was looking at the effect of climate change and how that might affect animals that feed on the eucalypts in, in future times, for example, koalas. But as I read about this, I became more and more aware that there was a lot of cyanide in crop plants. And in fact, one in five crop plants contain cyanide. So, the, and I realised that it was actually causing some issues for human health around the world. And one particular crop is this tuber at the front called cassava. So this is a street stall. Tubers are very important for food security around the world. And cassava is very, very important for feeding people. A billion people eat it every day. We don't eat it much in Australia, but it's very important. However, it can actually be very high in cyanide. And in fact, it is the only staple crop that can kill you if it's not properly processed. That's apart from green potatoes. So people do die, probably every day a couple of people around the world would die from eating cyanide from unprocessed cassava. But mostly it's associated with neurological disorders, for example, paralysis. So these children here have a disease called Konzo. It's a paralysis of the lower limbs and uh, once it's developed, it's permanent. And this was first diagnosed as a disease, identified as a disease around about 1980, 
by a Melbourne doctor called Dr Julie Cliff. And she was working in Mozambique and she was going around and there was this new disease, a real epidemic and a lot of it. And they didn't know what it was. And they thought maybe it was some kind of polio or something else like that. So they went round and the people kept saying it's something to do with the food. And eventually she drew the connection between the high cyanide in the cassava and the paralysis. And so she realised that it was, was in fact something to do with the food and it was cyanide. Now, around about this time, there was a, another Australian researcher, a guy called Howard Bradbury, and he retired around about this time from the chemistry department at ANU and was looking for a retirement hobby. And he was really interested in the effect of cyanide on human health. And he got in touch with Julie and they decided that they would test the flour in the marketplaces. And they found that in a normal year, the flour made from cassava has about 15 to 20 parts per million cyanide. But in fact, um, in a drought year, it was more than 10 times as much, over 200 parts per million. Now, the World Health Organization recommendation for food is to have less than 10 parts per million cyanide. So you can see even in a normal year, it is above what the recommendation is. So I was reading about these things while I was working on eucalyptus and I really thought that uh, and I've been looking at the effect of climate change on how these plants would change, uh, and I wanted to know what would happen to Konzo. So would the cyanide in cassava change with climate change, as I'd seen with the eucalypts? So we've got rising carbon dioxide, we have increasing global temperatures, and while the world as a whole may be wetter in the future, the parts of Africa where people rely on cassava is predicted to get much drier. So... As a result of this, I got in touch with Julie and I got in touch with Howard and other researchers and I set up a whole series of experiments. And most of these have been done at Monash by a whole range of different students and, and colleagues. And we've grown the plants at high carbon dioxide, low. We've watered them, we've droughted them, we've rewatered them, we've grown them in hot conditions, warm conditions. Cassava doesn't grow in cold conditions. And we've applied salt water to them to see what the effect of sea level rise might be. So we've done all these experiments and I'm just going to tell you about one of those now. So this is a, an experiment that was done by two honours students who looked at different aspects of the one experiment and they had about 100 cassava plants and they were either watered or droughted. The drought was imposed by weighing the pots and only applying, reapplying about 25% of the water that they'd lost. And so they did this for a couple of months and they took lots of samples of the leaves and the stems and the tubers uh, so we could analyse them chemically. And then they actually took half the droughted plants and rewatered them for a few weeks to see if the plants would recover. So what they found was, not unsurprisingly, plants that had access to water had bigger tubers. That's not surprising. The plants that were droughted only had very small tubers. These plants were quite young, only six months old. Interestingly, after even only two weeks of rewatering, the tubers were in fact starting to develop again in these plants. So it does suggest that rewatering is, is a, quite a good way to increase your yield. But what was happening to the cyanide? Well, if the, this graph shows the amount of cyanide in parts per million in the droughted plants on the right and the watered plants on the left. So you can see the droughted plants have much more cyanide than the watered plants. That red line is the World Health Organization recommended level for the maximum amount of cyanide in food. So we get, this confirmed, and in fact was the first study to actually show definitively that drought increases the cyanide in cassava. So that the reason you get conzo epidemics during drought times is not just that people are eating more cassava, but that the cassava itself contains more cyanide. But the other interesting thing these girls discovered was in fact that when we rewatered the plants, the cyanide concentration came right down in the tubers, even though it only been rewatered for two weeks. And this actually suggests that there could be a, a this could be a simple intervention that if people did have access to irrigation water they could water the plants just for a week or two before they harvested them and it may actually make them safer to eat. This is just a hypothesis. It hasn't been tested yet, but it's a good idea that what someone should do. So we did all these experiments and tried to work out how to predict what will happen to cassava in the future. And like so much of science, it's complicated. So we found that drought increased the toxicity. Carbon dioxide increases the toxicity, mainly through reducing the protein levels. Uh, temperature affects the cyanide levels. And then there's all kinds of odd interactions. So if you have high temperatures, the drought is more severe. So that's an interaction. There's weird interactions between carbon dioxide and drought. Uh, 
There's interactions between temperature and carbon dioxide. So all in all, this makes it very hard to predict what's going to happen in the future. And really, a better thing would just be to have no, no toxins in the cassava at all. So why don't we try and genetically engineer cyanide out of cassava and improve it that way? So in terms of re removing the cyanide from cassava, there's really three different routes. The first one is don't eat it. The second one is genetically modify it. And the third one is change the processing methods. Not eating it isn't really realistic. The, this is a really important food security crop. A billion people eat, eat it every day. 40% of sub-Saharan Africa live on it. So it's not, it's not feasible to not eat it. However, what you could do is that as you can tolerate cyanide, if you have some more protein in your diet, the thing would be to lift people out of poverty so they could improve their diet. So if people can incorporate fish or vegetables into their diet, uh, they were less likely to get uh, diseases and conzo. And in fact, people living on lake shores eating fish almost never get conzo. You never see it in those conditions. So that's one thing. Uh, in terms of genetically modifying cassava, there are a lot of perspectives about this. So, for example, scientifically, it's possible, right? So it's been done, groups have done this, and we've done this for a different plant that also makes cyanide. And what we've all found is that there's some kind of weird trade-off between growth and cyanide. So uh, when the plants are young, it turns out that the plants without cyanide are a bit slower to get going. We're not quite sure what's going on, and that's ongoing research. But there is something there. And when you do genetically modify organisms, you can get some inadvertent consequences. So we're not quite sure. But it can be done, and it has been done. Politically, there are some issues. So many people don't want to eat uh, genetically modified organisms. And some countries in Africa have a ban on growing GMOs. So that's probably not realistically politically. And also, in terms of not being realistic, uh, is that these people are very poor. They're not going to be able to buy some kind of expensive technology. So if they were going to use GMO cassava, it would have to be given to them and provided philanthropically. And then the third issue around that is the social aspect. And it turns out there's actually a preference for eating high cyanide cassava. Now, you think that's weird. Why should people do that? Well, first of all, they're probably more pest resistant. So that's one thing. But another thing is that the women do the processing. And high cyanide cassava in Africa puts women in charge of the food chain. So people uh, won't come and steal your crop. If you have soldiers going through, they're not going to take your food because it has to be processed. And this way, the women can control the food supply. And so it's actually very important socially. And I think this just illustrates that point that scientifically, we can come up with all kinds of great alternatives for reducing cyanide, but in the end, you've got to work with local people and see what's acceptable. So that leaves processing. And there are many different ways to process cassava. Some of them are very effective and some of them are less effective. In uh, Nigeria, they tend to use a fermentation process, which is reasonably effective for normally grown cassava. And it tends to make the, the product quite sour tasting. And that is not acceptable in Southern Africa. They don't like the taste. And so what they do there is they either just soak the cassava and cook it or they grind it up into a flour and uh, make a kind of a chapati out of it. That's the most common way to eat it in southern Africa. And it's not particularly effective at taking the cyanide out. So Howard, who has spent the last 35 years now since his retirement working on this problem, uh, has done two things. First of all, he's developed test kits that are given to plant breeders in Africa so that they can test the varieties, so they don't have these really high cyanide varieties. And the other thing is that he's developed a new, very simple method for reducing cyanide in the food crop, and he calls it the wetting method. And what he's done is he's introduced a step between mixing the flour with the water and the cooking. And if you add another step in there where you spread that out, and you leave it in the sun or leave it in, the, in a warm place, the cyanide just goes off into the air. And it is so effective, it reduces the amount of cyanide in the, in the food by 95% and renders it completely safe. So it's a very simple system. However, it's quite challenging to change people's way that they treat their food. And he's produced a lot of brochures. So you can see here, there's a picture of a boy with Conzo and uh, a step-by-step -step guide. And these are available in about 40 different languages. 
And in parts of Mozambique where they've rolled this out through the health department in collaboration with Julie Cliff and, and the, the other Mozambican workers, this has been very effective in reducing disease in those areas. Uh, so it's a highly effective method. It's been very effective in, in Congo. They've done interventions there and everywhere they do the interventions, they don't see any conzo. So normally you, in a village you might get one or two cases a year or one or two cases every couple of years with epidemics during droughts. Since they've introduced these methods, they don't get any. So it's highly effective and it's very, very simple. So I guess I've come full circle. I did actually become a doctor. I've got a PhD in botany and I work to improve human health in Africa. So in conclusion, I'd just like to leave you with a, with a word of advice. If you want to save the world, if you want to make a difference, don't study medicine, study plants. <laughs> Thank you.